Oh, they getting on now, Coach. They getting on. Seriously, you can see it, huh? Yeah, yeah, on mine, I can I can see them logging in, Coach. I, I can see the numbers jump. 20, 30, 40, whatever they are, I can see them. You can't see them up in the corner, Coach. Up in the corner, you don't see them? Oh, live. Oh, no, that's just the count. Hold on, maybe that's uh, it, it may not show you how many people are viewing it, Coach. I don't know. No, oh, man, you over there, you running the machine, Coach. All right, Coach, I want to welcome everybody to HBCU Coach's Corner with none other than the SWAC legend himself, SWAC champion himself, Johnny Cole, and I'm his trusty sidekick, Rocky. We got a lot going on in the SWAC, SWAC this week, Coach. It's almost yes, like sir. it's not even off season, coach. There's there's not football games going on, but there's certainly other games going on, uh, no doubt, coach. Before we get started with any of that, coach, tell me how you doing, coach? Man, doing good, coach. You know, I always look for Tuesday night, man, just to get a lot off my chest and uh, you know try to educate people and try to give people some different views on how to look. You know, instead of looking from the Outside in, they can get some somewhat what's on the inside of, of some of this decision making and some of these directions that the our HBCUs are going. Some of them good, bad, and the ugly. But always, always glad to chit chat with you, Coach. Oh man, you know it's always a pleasure of mine, Coach, to to come on here and let you educate the masses and dialogue with our followers and listeners. Man, it's always a great day and. Uh, uh, just a minute, you know, yesterday I thought I was coming down with something, coach, but I, I, I I'm using, I'm, at this point, I'm using my, the power of positive thinking, coach. I'm trying to, uh, but I am taking that, I am taking, taking that music next coach as I, as I'm dealing with it, but I'm, uh, you know, but like I say, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, uh, in a situation where it, it ain't got me yet. Coach It's trying to get me and I'm trying to. I'm trying to shake it, coach, and I'm doing everything I can to uh, stay healthy. And I definitely don't want to pass it on to Keisha, whatever I got. So I'm just just trying to stay healthy, coach. But as we as we go ahead. No, I, I said we definitely don't want to do that. We don't want to pass it on to the missus. No, 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 definitely. Hey, but coach, as we get as we get started today, coach, there's so much going on across the entire landscape of HBCU football, right? And when we talk about that, we 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 really talking about coaching hires, coaching searches, coaching situations, and it's it's uh and at the top of that list is FAMU, and I and we have to bring in our FAMU correspondent, none other than Bishop Detective <laughs> Campbell, to give hey, us a yo. FAMU update on. What's going on at FAMU up to this point? Last week when we left, Mr. Campbell, uh, we were in. It was a lot of uh, tumultuous situations going on. Can you give us some type of insight into what was what's going on at FAMU? Well, well, first of all, I'm just happy that FAMU keeps being in the news because that means I can keep coming back on on every Tuesday night. You know, so I, I don't know what I'm going to do on a Tuesday when FAMU finally gets their act together. So you know, I guess we'll just start right there. But, Coach, I appreciate you having me on. You know what I mean? Rocky, once again, we're here on a Tuesday night. And once again, on another Tuesday night, fam, you still doesn't have a football coach. Well, so. well, we, well we, we just let you know how important Florida and m are. You know, different conferences have different different teams that are powerhouses, and we consider Florida and m as one of those schools. Well, Coach, you know, Florida and m has a proud history, as you well know, going back to Jake Gaither. It is one of those true blue blood programs that's been revitalized by Coach Simmons, who is now at Duke. And what we're trying to do is protect that legacy. You know, that's what everybody from the alumni and fans and things like that. Because, Coach, as you know, when you, when you got those those big names of Grambling, Jackson State, FAMU, Southern, it just makes 
college football, HBC football better when they're good. Because those are the games that people want to see. Those are the games that across the week you can go look and circle your calendar saying, hey, who is FAMU playing? Oh, they're playing Alabama State. Who is Jack State playing? Oh, they're playing Texas Southern. So you really want those, you know, frontline schools to really be exciting and have a strong fan and again, good quality, you know, football. So, you know, Rocky, you, so what you saw on Sunday, basically, I guess we'll get right into it is that we had the search committee meeting because it wasn't a board of trustees meeting. I want to be very clear on that. And the search firm presented five of their candidates. And then from there, the um, search committee presented from those candidates. Then they selected who they thought they felt would be best for FAMU football. Now, of course, people have heard the names. We're not going to talk about the names here because we just want to make sure we protect the integrity. But the, the names are out there and people know who they are. But one of the things that, once again, that's concerning about this, and as I talk, I talked to a person that runs a search firm, and the question is, is that fam, you really get their money worth for that? Because if you put up a portal, because I, I want to talk to people how a search firm really works, usually, especially on a higher level. Usually, they have already helped select the coaches and things like that, but really, it really has to do with search firm having a relationship with agents, and they've already reached out, and they say, hey, you're an agent. We have a relationship. We have this opening. Is your guy interested? When I heard that 41 people allegedly apply for the job, we know 41 people are not qualified for that job. That's not possible. That, that's not possible. So the fact that you would even let that be inundated with 41 people and brag about that, that's not something to brag about because, Coach, we kind of talked about that. We, you could narrow down who was qualified for this job just really quickly. You know, honestly, and if you just be honest, coach, we I think we probably came up maybe 15 names, Max, and that was even a stretch, you know, on that. So right. to brag that you said that you had 41 people applying for the job to me, that means you didn't do your due diligence, because what right. that also does is slow down the process, because then you have to say and look at it and things like that. So my concern with the search firm was, did they actually go out, talk to these people? Did they say, okay, I know who you are. I see your resume based off the criteria that we're looking for. Is this what you want to do? And I don't think that really happened because when you start looking at the names and people know, look, coach, me and you sat down, Scott has been on the show and Rocky could tell you this coach, me and you probably named eight of the 10, honestly, on the last two shows. And they could have paid us that 30 or $40,000. Really? I mean, if that was the case, you know, I mean, me and you could have did it for 10 a piece, man. They gave them some change back. Well, look, we might need this. That might be our next adventure. Well, well, Coach, I'll tell you what. Uh, the one thing I do, I got the connection with all the agents. And I'm talking about agents that know the coaches. I know, and the thing about it, and you know, we're in that wheelhouse. I got a lot of friends that are coaches all over. That's why when I, I made phone calls, I was able to quickly identify nine out of the ten people just off of their resume because we had already talked about it. So, again, if they want to pay somebody 34, because I tell you what, Coach, I know what me and you both can do. We can actually get the coaches on the phone. Yeah. I know well, we could do that. Well, that's what I, that's what I was going to mention. What, what, you know, I know Coach is modest in this regard, but Coach pretty much brought guys on who were unemployed to come on this show who now have jobs. You know what I mean? To kind of showcase their ability to communicate in front of audience and things like that. You know, me being naive, I had no idea, you know, some of the guys I was familiar with, some of the guys I wasn't, but I, I, what comes to mind is, is is Coach Joseph. You know, Coach Cole brought Coach Joseph, and I didn't, in the, in, at the time, I didn't understand the relevance of Coach Joseph. You know, he had, he had coached in the SWAC and this, that, and the other, but at the time, Coach Cole knew that there were two vacancies of Blue Blood program in the SWAC. And he wanted to get coach. He wanted to get Coach Joseph in front of that audience. And lo and behold, Coach Joseph lands one of those jobs. I don't think that's a by accident or coincidence. And so, in, in a in a roundabout way, Coach, you are a search firm. Uh, look, we got we got to get certified so we can make some money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, one of the things that I've that I've witnessed when you're talking about top level executives and they, and they use search firms, what they, what they, what I thought they always did. The most important thing that search firms did is built, built a profile of a candidate would, that would work for said organization or company. 
You know what I mean? They build a profile of focusing on a set of skills or a set of qualities that is required for that candidate at that organization, right? And so um, I don't know that they had enough time in between when they were hired and when they were and when they had the search committee meeting to to really put together a comprehensive profile of the kind of coach and his and he and their uh, uh, attributes that's required to do a great job at FAMU. I'm not sure that there's enough there was enough time or much time spent on that if you were trying to simultaneously receive and sift over applications and also draw up a profile for a coach. It doesn't seem like that was done. Uh, in my opinion, coach. Yeah, well, well, let's just cut through the chase. I mean, you know, you said it earlier, uh, Bishop. Uh, it's it's about agents, and 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 I got my guy, and I got my guy, and I got my guy. And these search firms, you know, it's a, it's a little different than than being on uh, uh, LSU's campus or uh, Duke's campus than HBCU's campus. Facilities are different, you know. Kids are different. You know, let's face it, those Division One kids, they go into those Division One schools to play on the next level. You know, on, on HBCU level, you might find you two or three of those kids or four or five of those kids, but most of those kids are there to graduate from school. So so that it, it, at the end of the day, to me, all that is a smoke screen. Uh, smoke screen. I want my guy, you know, if I'm an agent, I got four or five guys. Man, you want this job? You want this job? Let me make a call. That don't make them the right person and the right guy for that, that, that job. And what happens again, HBCU coaches get left out that are ready, you know, the next person up. And so so they get left out. And, and you know, I've always said it, uh, Rocky, only 75, 75% of the coaches are losers. You got that 25%. And most of them got jobs. And you can tell a great coach. A great coach can bounce from school to school, to school, because he had that ingredient. I was speaking to one of my friends today, and we kind of had a disagreement on what makes a great coach. He felt it was the institution. I told you, I disagree with that. It's that individual. You know, everybody can, you you can take mama's cooking, and it don't matter what kitchen she in. You know, if she's a great fried chicken person, she going to cook the best fried chicken. I just believe that. I believe some of it falls on the individual, because you guys know, uh, Bishop, you know, you got to work around a lot of things in, in HBCU. You know, a lot of things ain't in place. And you got to be able to have been those places, identify those things, and be able to move forward in the HBCU program. You got you, 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 it, it's, it's not ready made. You know, when you walk into an HBCU uh, uh, job, it's not like just add water. You know, I, I cook, I, hey, Rock, I cook hell of a, some, some pancakes. Aunt your mama just add water pancakes, but I throw me a little butter in there, you know, and a little milk, and I get them going, and I make them real thin. You know what I'm saying? That's my ingredient. So every anywhere I go. You, you have to, you have to, what, what you're saying is you have to, there's no just add water solution in, at the HBCU no. level. And, I, and, I, and I'll bring up a point that I think that was completely overlooked about, the candidates that were, I'll put it like this. The search firm, in my opinion, should have made it a priority that anybody who was a candidate for this job has some type of recruiting connection to the state of Florida. And that should have been detailed on the person's resume is what's your recruiting connection? What's your history? What's, you know what I mean? Because that's essential, in my opinion, to success at FAMU. Like you can be whoever, you can be whatever coach. You can have the great greatest exits in those guys you want to. But until you can get that, those kids from Florida to buy into FAMU, I think FAMU, you know, is gonna suffer as a program. As you as you have said in the past, Mr. Campbell, Flo Florida recruiting base is essential to the success of FAMU. And anybody who holds that position must be have a plan to to get those Florida recruits. Well, I, I want to make one quick point. I saw somebody said I was delusional. I'm not delusional if the search firm says they specialize in finding coaches for this level. So how is that making me delusional? 
they said they specialize on looking for coaches at this level. So that means they should have a Rolodex and be it lawyers, agents, people that represent them to find those players. So I'm not delusional. They said that's what they do, not me. So again, I don't understand what that point was made. Cause again, a $250,000 job, according to them, they had 41 people apply for it. So clearly people wanted the job. We knew 10 people that they referred. So it's all relative to the levels that you want. So my point of it is, is that if this firm says, hey, we, at this price, we can. Oops, I think I just lost you guys. I'm no, no. You, you there. You good. You back. We can hear you. No, uh, I'm, I'm oh, sure he's going to Well, let, let, let me say this, Rocky. And this firm talking about where we, we go. I want to know how many championship coaches. I'm about that, championships, coach. That, that, that's I what ain't about just getting a guy in a slot. We, you, you, you can find plenty of jobs uh, uh, and put them in a head job. I, I want a champion. I want what, what, what my program need. My program need need a championship coach. Championship that, coach know how to recruit. Know how it's important. Know know the importance of recruiting his base. Like you say, some type of Florida tie. And that's what I want. I want a championship guy. You know, I coach, don't. I don't want I, Florida and them ain't no startup program. Uh, let Let me ask you this, coach. Now, when they were when they, I, I watched every minute of the of, of the uh, um, um, the the search committee meeting on Sunday. One thing that the search firm mentioned is that there were a lot of guys on there with hardware who had won championships so on and so forth and a couple guys that were that had applied they mentioned that those coaches had won championships in the swag you know other coaches they mentioned that had hardware from other conferences right and so with that being said this it was even at this point it was a popular job because there were championship co coaches who had considered who uh, applied for this job so this is like to your point, coach. This hey, is I, I like to know. I, yeah, I like to know who some of those coaches are, because uh, most of the ones on one championships in the swag is on on the shelf. Well, and, and they're available, yeah. right, coach? Yes, sir. you know. Yes, you, sir. you know during during the the search committee meeting, we were able to, able to kind of deduce or surmise certain people who may have applied, right? Um, right. and, and I won't mention anybody who doesn't have who who currently has a job, but when they said this person will have won two championships in the SWAC, that really narrows it down as to who that candidate was. You know, I think it was candidate 14. They talking about this guy's won recently won two championships in the SWAC. Like when you and you think about that, who has won two championships? And I and, and right off the top of the dome, um, what comes to mind is I want to say in you know Coach Fobbs and Coach McNair right. Right. were they you know candidates for this job? That's that's because I think both of those guys have at least two championships for sure. Um, and then well, there were well, there were other candidates who had championships at, at at the HBCU level. Could be at a lower level. It could be in the MEAC, you know. Uh, and a lot of people suggested that. Uh, you know, I'm, I wasn't familiar with, I, I'm familiar with the name Rob Broadway, but he seemed like he had retired some time ago. And then they were, they had, they mentioned the name Sam Washington and, and uh, things too. like that yeah. as, as, as him being a potential candidate based on the description of the, uh, of the uh, candidates who had applied. Cause they did mention some of their credentials. What I was, what I was mentioning to coach Mr. Campbell was that, during the call, several of the, the 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 firm mentioned that there was a candidate who had won recently won two SWAC championships. You know right. what I mean? And that yeah. kind of narrows it. That, I mean, like like that really narrows. The yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's why I was like, it was ludicrous to think that you didn't know who that was. You know what I mean? So yeah, it, you know that, that. I mean, how many people have won SWAC championships that are you know again that are still coaching or well, I guess you consider that person not coaching. But again, I, I mean, Coach Five won two SWAC championships, so that would be him. Coach Sanders would be two. He's at Colorado. You know, he ain't coming. <laughs> you know, then you got, and I'll just say you got Fred McNair. I mean, so, you know, it, it, it doesn't get where. You, 
here's my thing now. Okay, we narrowed down championships. Now I want to know, does he fit what we do? You know what I mean? Or what we want. Can he sell the university? He can't come in there looking down at the ground and pick feet for me. I like a guy with swag. I like a guy with confidence. I like a guy that knows what he's doing, uh, you know, when he gets in that slot. You know, I don't want no guy that can't get up and speak and go go help me raise some money. So, yeah, you know, that narrows it down as well, too. You know what I'm saying? So so those are things that, that – and has he, has he won here, picked his stuff up, went over here, played – has he won there? Has he won there? You know, and has he been in the position of being in being in control? That's that's just what I, you know. When I'm when I'm thinking about when you talk about Florida and him, when you talk about a guy that can pick his system up, will his system work here? Usually, a guy have a winning system, he can go anywhere and win. Anyway. Well, coach. That, that, that's the thing, and I think that's why, it to me, it was disingenuous to say that you had all these candidates, because what you just said, all these candidates not fit that profile that you just mentioned. They don't fit the profile. So when you start narrowing down, and then what Rocky said, can you recruit the state of Florida? Have you recruited the state of Florida? How many players have you on your team? You know, Do you know the coaches in the state of Florida? All those things start narrowing it down, and then what's upsetting, I guess, for a lot of people, you got people on the staff that start checking these boxes off. You know what I mean? They start checking these boxes off. And then you say, well, okay, let me open it up. And that's great. But then it goes back to my point. I coach and I named, it was only about 10 qualified candidates that could go. Then you got to ask the honest question, which I've said, and I asked coach said he was on. I've been coach Fred. If you got a coach and the player saying, if that guy comes 30 or 40 of us out the door, that has got to come into play. Well, well, well see, now that's where the athletic director comes into play. And I know y'all don't want to make decisions, but I guess you already did, is do I want to blow this ship up? We just come off the national championship. Do I want to keep this game going? So then what? Now my, I'm looking at my assistants. You know what I mean? Or I'm looking at a guy that can come in and keep everything in place. It's just the AD's philosophy. Or am I going to blow the ship up, go outside, and get a coach? In my mind, I think things is already there. I think one of those assistant coaches, we shouldn't even be here, to be, to no. be honest. We, coach. We, one of those assistants should have got a head job and, and, and maybe gave him two years with, with, with a rollover of two if he, if he continues it, you know what I mean? Or after two years, if he don't get it done, then, then he got a third year and he out. Or, we, or, we shouldn't really be here. Or, or let, let's let's be perfectly honest. I think there's a, I think there's a scenario where a, a AD with a vision and a purpose can come in and say, "Hey, we're not going to keep the current staff for whatever reason, right? Let the kids know we're going to take a different direction in choosing a the a new coach." That way the kids get an opportunity to enter the portal if they choose. She can have a, a search where the, the FAMU alumni, alumni have an expectation of what's to come. And she okay. can deal with that blowback out let, in the let, open. Out in the me, open. It, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to give the idea that it's being done under the cover of darkness and she's trying to pull a fast yeah. one on the fan base, because in my opinion, the fan base are her allies. She's going to need these people to show up each and every Saturday at Bragg Memorial Stadium. She's going to need these guys to travel to the Swag Meag Challenge. She's going to need these guys to travel to come out to the Swag Championship. So these are her allies. They are in it together, and for whatever reason, it doesn't All seem right. as if she is, she feels that she's an advocate for the fan base at all, man. She feels me, like he wants to just go out on this as Long Ranger. Let me let me, let me say this: y'all see, belt on, we yes. at the top of the roller coaster. Now, my sources tell me, and I guess it's back in her. You had six police arrests on the football team. Your APR is at its lowest. 
I don't know if you know that, Mr. Campbell. I don't know well, if you know that, Rocky, but that's what my sources are telling me. Well, okay, well, okay. And, so and let's, let, 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 let me finish for a minute. Okay, yeah. Of course, that ain't nothing that you want to try to get out in the public. And I don't know if she was trying to hack some of that. You know what I mean? But when now we're going to blow up the ship, I might even help her light the, light, light the fire. You know what I'm saying? But go ahead, Mr. Campbell. Well, here's the thing. APR is not, you can't hide that, okay? So we knew what the APR, but Coach Simmons just reported, and let's talk about that. Our next APR report, according to Coach Simmons, it's the only thing I could go on because it hasn't been official from the NCAA, it's going to be 950, okay? So that means right there, it's already moving in the right direction. She was brought in to be the compliance person. So she can't sit back and say, so we've gone from 898 to 950, and then we should be going, and then we have another 950. So that means we're going in the right direction. So I guess for me, the problem is, is that part of APR is putting in guardrails and having people in compliance, making sure people go into class, making sure our students are taking the right classes on the, to progress and graduation. That's what she's supposed to be hired for. Because again, if you want to sit back and not give the coach the tools to monitor that, then guess what you're doing? You're going to have the situation what we have. She was brought in for that. So my question is, you're going to say, well, I'm going to hire a coach that's focused on APR. I don't even know what that really means. Because part of that, the coach is not a compliance officer. See, that's my it's, thing. It's that, it's that he going he to make going to class a priority, number one. What about, right. the six, what about the six arrests in the city? Kids got arrested. So, Coach, this is what I'll say. And I can't speak because I haven't seen that. Again, anytime somebody gets arrested, it's probably it's public record. You can't hide it. You know what I mean? So, and trust me, Tallahassee police is not going to do family football players no favors. I'm just going to tell you that. So, if we had six arrests, so if she's going to say, "Well, this could this team was out of control." Then, I, you know, then you know, here's the thing, Coach. What I've said, then be transparent with people, because again, I've said this a thousand times. If you say, "Hey, I'm looking at this." While we have done well on the field, we have not done well off the field. I think that might have something to do with what we have right now. I want to bring somebody in because we want to have both. Then sell your vision to people. Then make that be a priority. Let people understand that. But then once again, if you're saying, well, you, like you say, your sources and what you're saying, I say the APR is moving in the right direction. I don't know about the six arrests. Clearly, they're not felony arrests. Because clearly, we didn't have six people that were off the team. You know what I mean? And stuff right. like that. So again, I, again, when people say arrested, what what were they arrested for? I I, I got to give my young well, man from Fam you some credit on that. So right, yeah, so and, yeah, and yeah. AD, Rocky, you the AD now. Your APR is maybe trending in the right direction. The team has had six arrests and whatever else is going on. Do you blow the ship up, Co Coach? With, you, coach, here here's me, Coach. Here's me. If I'm the AD, if I'm the AD. I make whatever I make. I have a family to take care of. And I'll say this, it, whether it be Coach Cozy or Coach Roll, as long as they keep this train on the tracks, we're going to be all right with APR and we're going to be all right with those arrests, right? Because at the end of the day, you can have a straight A football team. You can have no arrest in five, ten years. But if you don't win football games, me and the coach are going home. Coach, See, I, it's, I, uh, it's, I, it's I about know the APR is important to quote unquote, but I've said it before on this show, Duke, Vanderbilt, Harvard, you don't win football games, they'll let you play your contract out and they'll go find somebody else. So, I, you know, you know, that's for the public's eye, and that's that. But at the end of the day, I, I believe in what you say, Rocky. You got to win football game. So, so I, have a, I have a very good friend who is a Division One Power 5 coach, and he works with APR in some regard. And the, the fact of the matter is you got to find guys who can go to class and achieve and play football. That's the that's the challenge of every school. You you those are the players now at those power five schools, they have so much su support staff, whether it be 
tutors, whether it be people who are who make sure that they attend class, make sure they log in online, make sure that they have weekly checkups. They have so much support staff that you actually got to be an imbecile if for some reason you're not making progress toward gradu- graduation. You doing it on purpose. And those guys and those guys who can't do is not making progress toward gradu- graduation. They they unceremoniously release those guys if they can't do that because they understand at that point you're not going to be eligible to play. I don't care if you run a four three and you're six foot nine, two hundred and fifty pounds. You're not going to be eligible, so you're not going to be able to help us if you won't go to class and get your books and use the system that's put before you to stay eligible and stay uh, on progress toward graduation. Let, let me tell you what else they do as well. You know, because the school has got uh, that got to understand and they set a precedence that football is important. They they go out and create curriculums, different curriculums for kids to go through. As long as you got your basics, you know, uh, park recreation degree, some administrative, some type degree. They they got avenues because they understand that every kid that come to college is not coming to college to graduate from school. He's coming to college, well, when we talk about athletes, he's coming to college to play football. We're talking about football players. So they created avenues that a kid can 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 migrate through and not only play football, he gets some type of degree while he's there. So and I think at HBCUs, we we don't have that. You know, we we as blacks for some reason, and I'm gonna say this. Since 1936, when Jesse James went over to Germany and won the Olympics over there, athletics been the vehicle for black people, man, for years. Joe Lewis, I hear my mother you used to talk about Joe Lewis. He was a leader. You know what I'm saying? Jesse, uh, 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 all the black leaders that came through. You, you were talking about Jesse Owens, Coach, but I Jesse know you were Jesse Owens and, and Jim Brown. And the greatest of all time, Muhammad Ali, Lou Alcindor, these guys were our, Bill Russell, these guys were our leaders, man. It was a, and most of those guys when we grew up, y'all know, that was in office in, in politics, had graduated first from a black school. And number two, they were all athletes. You, you know, for coach. Some I, reason, so for some reason, we try to push athletics to the side. You know, like you always say, Rocky, we don't take it, we we don't make it important. We always talk about academics. I, it, believe me, it's important, and it's going to carry you longer. But athletics is just as important to make those schools valuable where we get the best. But good, that's what, that's what, what I want to finish on that. I, I'll let the representative from the number one HBCU in the country speak. <laughs> Now I'm gonna I'm gonna well, I'm I'm keep on letting y'all get away with that, but okay. But, but well, it, it is. But I, I think again, Bishop Bonnet. Hey, who, we put him off the show. No, I'm just go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I, I think Bishop Bonnet, who's in the chat, who represented Floyd and them at the highest level, both in the classroom and on the field, just said it best. He has seen it. He understands it. He has a job now. I think, Coach, what HBCUs have done, and I think they've done very well, they have prepared our athletes better than Power Fives. So I'm just going to be honest with you. I think we prepare them better. I've seen it. I'll tell you this in a quick story, and I think I told you. I had a friend of mine who played the NFL at Texas a and I have a Kevin Smith and all those guys, Quentin Correa, all those guys. I knew all those guys. And I had a friend of mine that played on that team with them. He said, Steve, you know what? I went to Texas a and I didn't get nothing from Texas a and I get more job opportunities from people that went to Prairie View, that played football, that I played in high school with from Prairie View, than I get from anybody from a and so that says a lot, just that alone, what we do with what we have. So I think, again, I think, and I want to be specific about FAMU. I think FAMU had an issue with APR. We did. I mean, it's this public knowledge. I think, once again, the year before the AD got there, because the team met with Dr. Robinson, they started putting compliance up. They made sure that the players were taken care of. We moved forward. Then they hired AD Sykes. I'm pretty sure she put a focus on that. So I believe family, once again, will achieve that goal. But I think we've always been able to produce football players that have always been not only great football players, but great citizens once they've left FAMU. And, you know, and I, I go ahead, coach. 
Well, H- well, that's what HBCUs are made for. It's made for people like us to go to school where we feel uncomfortable. We see people who look like us. We talk about people who look like us, who understand us and guide us. When you at those par five schools, I, I, I miss with my brother all the time. He finished from the University of Nebraska. I said, well, how many times have you been to the University of Nebraska? And I laughed. I said, man, I can go back today, 40 years later, and somebody on that campus is going to know me. If my brother go to Nebraska, he'd be stuck in the middle and in, in, in the student center. So, so there's no question so this- that, that, that graduates from HBCUs, man, are way more prepared. Uh, and, and we, of course, we're talking about the mass than, than, than guys that go to those par five schools. Well, well, I, I think, and this is something, you know, I, just to say, I have a daughter that's that's going to Prairie View. So, but before she went to Prairie View, we did extensive research about what uh, HBCU education meant, what going to Prairie View in particular meant her, uh, to her and her field that she was going into. And when you talk about when you're talking about how black people perform on the job, right? They, they, even though they represent only 25% of the total student population, right? They far and away when you talk about measurables, right? You know, things like salary and executive positions and all the, they, they by far represent uh, the majority of the high performing uh, employees out there in the workforce right now. I'll just I'll just put it like that. Not to, not to shade someone with a PWI education, but but when you when you just simply say what are PWIs doing versus what are HBCUs doing, and whatever metric you want to use, measure an employee by HBCU graduates or outperforming PWI graduates, considering they only represent twenty five percent. Of the, stu- of the black student population. I, I don't want to get political, uh, uh, but, and that's why when you hear, but the only thing about it is we don't reach those CEO spots like we should. You know, we don't get paid as much as money as our counterpart. And, and, and surely we got Nikki Haley running around talking about the United States is not prejudice. You know, I'm <laughs> totally against that. Well, she, well, she, she got to understand, I don't know what she looking for. When you look at the top 100 CEOs in the country, and, and over 50 percent of them are Caucasian, <laughs> what, what, what is she talking about? That none of us have achieved those type of numbers? Well, well I, I, I'll use you and your brother for instance, Coach Cole. You and uh, LC Cole. You guys both achieved head coaching positions where? At HBCU. black college football, yes. you understand what I'm saying? That's the only by, way we by, go. By, by, by any other measure, you would think that that LC Cole would have had an opportunity because he is a graduate of a PWI that he would have an opportunity to possibly be a head coach at Nebraska or a PWI. But right. he 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 was even with his PWI graduation uh, degree, his level of success matched yours. Right. And I think that's the case for a lot of people in the workforce. A PWI doesn't give you any advantage in the workforce. And and HBCU grad, graduates often, often perform at the same level or higher. When you think about when you talk about lawyers and doctors and people like that, and I know we've gotten this is a little off sports, but I think it's very important. HBCUs are overrepresented in the black doctors, black attorneys. Black veterinarians, there's so many prof- professions they, that they're overrepresented in. Considering what I say, HBCUs only represent 25 percent of the total Black student population. And when you think about half of the doctors, half of the attorneys, no, no, I mean, 75 percent of the veterinarians all is, come well, from HBCUs. I'm, I think that's quite remarkable. Go ahead. And I'm going to take it. I'm going to go back and take it back to athletics. Then why are these athletic directors and these presidents in HBCUs always want to go after a guy with some NFL or 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 NBA? Oh, if he played pro, he can come in. Hey, here's the keys to our, our, our car. You you come in and be our head football coach. Why why we think that if you got played in the NBA, 
or the NFL that you qualified to come back and be the head coach of a school. And then they pay you more from the guy who graduates from HBCU. Coach Campbell, come on. Well, well that, that's easy. That, that's easy, Coach. And we, we talked uh, – well, no, I'm going to answer that because let's talk about the search firm. That requires you to have the knowledge of who the good coaches that are upcoming at all levels. So that requires you to network. That means you talk to other athletic directors. That means you talk to Congress commissioners and things like that. So the easy way out, because you haven't done your homework, because you don't know this space, you don't understand the space, hey, let me go hire – Football player A, let's just because I don't want to disrespect nobody. You know what I mean? Let's hire football player A. But see, this goes back to my point. We're not even incubating. We are not even because the question should have been this is what the commissioner should have did, right? From the swag, McClellan. He should have said AD Sykes, hey, you know what? I've got five coordinators in our conference that should interview for the job. Just to interview, just so you know who they are. Let me put those guys. The MEAC uh, commissioner should have said, I've got five DCs or two DCs, or one DC, that I think that should, could be great. Because that's how everybody else moves up. But again, if you're not giving people this list of people that are potential, because honestly, those are the people that's going to stay longer. Those are the people that are going to help build the program. Because if you get a guy that really has no connection, no understanding, they're taking this job because, oh, I want to skip, you know I mean? I really want to jump the line, right? I'm a, I'm a guy. I don't want to be a position coach here. I don't want to be a recruiter here. I just want to be a head coach because of my name, which is actually kind of disrespectful to Fair. understand. Fair. Because, because jobs to guys, because he played pro, meaning what that have to do with leadership, perseverance, you know, project manager, uh, directing kids, directing men. It has nothing to do with that. It's just that I was a great athlete and I played ball. And if you go back and look at all the numbers, all those guys have done a bad job at coaching. Like right now, school in Atlanta, they're actually going out trying to get some money raised to play, to, to give an NFL guy their head job. And so he could pay his coaches as well. Now, I, I believe there's some sen – this sentiment by EA is very interesting. I'll say that. It say, he says, because you're looked at as – I think he's talking about HBCUs. Because you're looked at as a second class to those athletes, you should be happy I'm even considering coming. That starts in the home at an early age. Now, our HB – are HBCU seen as less than among in athletic circles? Well, well, that's the thing. You're proving the point. If you haven't been around it, right, and you don't understand, and you think you're doing me a favor, this was one of the things, and when I heard that Coach Sanders was going to be hired at Jack State, I was excited. But the one thing that bothered me the most, that he wanted to act like it was a one-way street. It was a two-way street. Jackson State gave him as much as he gave to Jackson State. And then what happened, and Coach, you're going to understand this. We watched, and I have to use it as an example because I'm going to use it as an example. We watched him go to Colorado. And what we found out is that he wasn't like Coach Go. He didn't know when to say on third down, do this, or fourth down, do that. He let other coaches do that. And you saw them fail time and time again in time down and distant situations because he hadn't been like Coach Go, who had been in time down and distant situations. See, you can't fake coaching. It comes with experience. You have to know how to do these things, seeing these plays over and over again, being in these positions over and over again. So, no, you can play that game, but it's totally different when you've coached that game and coached it for, again, the work go up those ladders and up those rungs. And that's when you see the struggle. Let me <clears> say this to EA, EA. Put EA's deal back up there if you can. Okay, I will. I didn't play no NFL, neither. And my brother played one year. It ain't got nothing to do with back in your home. I'll, I'll be PWIs and HBCUs, you know. So, no, it don't have nothing to do that. It has something to do with what you want to do with coaching that you pick things up and you get knowledgeable of the game. 
It ain't about black or white. It ain't about NFL, or NBA, or ABCs. It's about a guy that wants to be a coach, have grew up in, in that uh, uh, realm, and, and have went out and learned the things. And I'll be, I've been the, the Bill Walsh uh, minority thing. I've been to Jimmy Johnson's school. I was chosen the 50 excellence college deal. I've done two stints at the Dallas Cowboys. I've done two stints at the Chicago Bears. So no, it has nothing to do. The only thing when it comes down to have something to do with color is about they make more money and they have more opportunities. And well, we we don't do our due diligence like Bishop Campbell said earlier about learning and getting in the realm of hiring people and being able to reach out to the people that can help you. That's what it gets them to do. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it real. In my, with my next comment. But before I make my next comment, I want everybody in the description go down and make sure that you click our YouTube channel. I'll put myself and Coach Cole's social media information in the description. Make sure you will follow us as well. But please make sure you like and subscribe to our channel. So, but this is what I'm going to say, Coach. The fact of the matter about HBCUs and this is not consistent among all HBCUs, but I'll just say what I've discovered. Not all HBCUs are serious about football. Hit, now, your, hit your money thing, Coach. Hit your money. But, but here's, here, here's the deal that I'll say, and I'll say this. But here's the, even more importantly. Even though you got schools like Duke, you got schools like you got basketball schools that may not be serious about football the way that Alabama and, and Florida is, right? They still understand that football is a big business and they treat football as such. So even when they're not serious about the actual uh, committing to winning, right, the, at the level that Florida and Alabama, they certainly – take the advantage and monetize their football programs as much as they possibly can within the, utilizing the, utilizing their football game, football teams to gain support and backing from their alumni, their community, and their overall fan bases. And I think that's sometimes what I think HBCUs miss the ball is that there is a huge segment of people like, like myself who would, if we knew what existed in HBCU football, if we knew – what the experience was all about, right? We would be just as enthusiastic and uh, 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 passionate about it, whether or not we went to HBCU or not. But what, for whatever reason, it's not marketed it to the to black people at large, and it's almost treated as an insular, exclusive product that you don't charge for. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you don't you don't charge a premium price for it. It's largely given away to those people who are uh, HBCU supporters and fans. Here, here's, here's, here's one of the issues, and y'all add to this as well. Because at HBCUs, the football programs don't quote unquote make a lot of money. They make some money, but they don't make a lot of money to carry. Our administration, as you say, don't take them serious. But I think they missing the point. It brings so much to the university. That's why these all these schools are trying to start up a football program, trying to start up a football program, trying to start up. Because at the end of the day, if you ain't gonna put money into the football program, they don't don't have a football program. And that's the problem here. These administrations who probably didn't play football when they came through, you know what I mean? Either some football player don't did something to them. Then they, when they get in these positions, they want to say who's you know who's in charge. The football coach on major colleges that have football programs is the face of the university. That's how important that position is. But we don't, at HBCUs, we don't see that. We think, like you said earlier, Coach Campbell, I'm lazy. I'm just going to go get me an NFL player. Or I'm going to go get me an NBA player. 
and not do the due diligence of getting the right person. We give in the way that that person who's representing the university to anybody, to anybody. And then you end up like we ended up at TSU winning 12 games in five years, winning 26 games in 10 years. And we keep doing it over and over and over again. It's, it's sickening. We need athletic directors, man, like a Patrick Simon that knows what to do and how to run a, a program and know what to do about winning in track and baseball and, and some of the non-revenue sports because he put the money in football to be able to generate money. But that's that's let me get off that course, but that's that's the problem. That is the problem. We don't take their football programs and make sure that we do right, not by our feelings, but do the business, the business side. We don't take care of the business side of it. All right, I'm going to be that guy, and I'm getting ready to do the political pushback. And I'm going to be the historian. So, Rocky, here's what I'm going to say, and I'm going to make this simple. Every HBCU in the SWAC is owed at least a half a billion dollars from getting cheated, okay? A half a billion dollars, minimum, every one of them. FAMU is owed $1.9 billion from the state of Florida. Not made up, owed, stolen from. You give FAMU $1.9 billion, what do you think our football program would look like? What do you think our facilities would look like? So then you say, well, you come in and you don't care. I'm going to tell you this. They don't care about football at Vanderbilt. They don't. Jack State outdraws out Vanderbilt. I tell you what, though, them people at Jack State care about football. The people at Grambling care about football. You clearly see people at Florida and them care about football. The people at Southern care about football. The people at Alabama State care about football. So I think what we do is we, we put us in a bucket where, hey, they don't care. Well, you know what? If, you're, if I'm fighting for my survival, the first thing I'm worried about is eating. But but hold up, Mr. Campbell. I just want to interject this. You bring bring up a very good point. But why doesn't Tiffany Sykes care about football and she's responsible well, for football? Well, I'm not gonna say no. Listen, see, no, 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 no. I'm not gonna say she doesn't care about football. What our issue is, and this goes by the communication, her vision and her direction doesn't look like the vision direction that we think it should. And I'm gonna say we the, the alumni. So this goes back to communication and things like that. This goes back to sitting down and letting people know what you're because that kind of goes back, you know, and Rocky, if we get a chance, that's why I want you to pull up that headline with that I article I sent you. I got it in the chamber. Be yeah, because that's going to tie into, because if you talk to the alumni base and you tell us what your vision is, because you got to understand something, look, and I'm telling you, and I'm proud of all these, I'm telling you that if that had been the same situation, I'm, it might not have been as much money, but I'm telling you, if you had a winning program down at Grambling, them folks would find some money. You got a winning program down in Southern, now folks will find some money. These people care about these programs. Same thing with FAMU. People are like, oh, I can't believe FAMU did. I knew that because we wanted a championship squad. Same thing. People from Jackson was finding all types of money to try to keep Dion, which was amazing. They were like, we're going to raise this. We're going to do this because they saw championship football. So my point of it is, is that I don't believe her, her issue is about communication. It's not that I believe she wants to be a, a, have an AD with a winning program. But again, it goes back to the communication of getting us to where we're trying to get to. What, what, what I'm saying about don't care, and I think Rocky will, will, will piggyback off of this. I'm not saying the love or not. I'm saying the administration, <laughs> the people in control that don't go out and raise the funds, don't go out and do their job, and don't put the right enough money into the program. I just don't think we, we, we do that on the administrative side, not on the alumni side, on the administrative side. And that's why it's so, so important to choose the right head football coach to be able to go out and help sell the program and win football games. You, you know, Mr. Campbell, you sent me, you, you, this is, this is getting to that point. This is, uh, I don't know what to think of this. I read this and this, <laughs> this is, what almost, is this? 
this is almost like she's put herself in an adversarial posture with the FAMU fan base. And as a leader, where does that work? Okay, Coach. I'm going to give you just a quick so reason why I have Rocky to bring this up. This article was written by clearly a friend of our athletic director. Clearly, clearly a friend because she said that she knew him. But the hit, go, go, scroll back down, Rock. Go back to the headline first. Go, go, go to the headline. Go, yeah, right there. FAMU alumni have met their match in 80 sites. Right then and there, what are we in, in a boxing match? Yeah. We're supposed to be working to So the headline already starts the problem. And then this was the thing that caught my eye. As she's writing this article and she says, it is amazing how people can turn on you and things like that. And then she says, the way FAMU alumni, boosters do have been kicking up, you would think 80 sites put a police uniform and shot an unarmed person of color in the back while running away. Hold she on, hold on, hold on. Go back down, son. Go back down, just right there. It says, first off, who to say that Division II coach can't be said? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, well, but that, that's, not, that's not an argument. That's not an argument. So she okay. goes and, and makes this statement and then turns around and goes and calls the alumni and win bold letters, the old guard. And then she says the women also are the same with the old guard. So the level of disrespect that you know that AD knew she was writing this article. You knew she gave her these talking points. And you think this is the way to build camaraderie and to build a consensus when you do a hit piece and say you met our man? See, this is what you have to understand. This is what people have to understand. You got to watch what you say and what you do because sometimes you got to learn when to be quiet. And for you, her to let her person, her friend, because this was her friend to write this. This is what the AD thinks about the FAMU alumni base. Hey, so for you I, to, I, I just want to. You I, think I she wanna, behind this? So, so this yeah. is what it says. It says the elect, athletic administration is still a man's world, and there are plenty of men, especially the old guard, who don't think women should be in charge of athletic departments. Heck, they don't think women should work in sports period but there's an ugly little secret some women especially the old guard feel the same way and they can be vicious but these rattlers have met their match so here's here's my point and this is this, this is why this article is disingenuous right this article makes it seem like the fact that tiffany sykes is a woman being a woman is the issue her being a woman is not an issue, and it's never been an issue since she's been on campus, as far as I know. The issue is that she, and I'll say this, has been adversarial with the fan base and alumni since the day she stepped on campus. And that's and that and I and that's Rocky yeah, talking. Y'all know where this article coming out of? Big big Doom, part. Doom, North Carolina. Yeah, it's coming out of Charlotte. Yeah, yeah, yeah this, this is her friend. But and, and Jamie Walker said it's a chess move. That's a bad chess move. Horrible chess because move. Because PR 101 tells you the first thing that you don't do is to disrespect those that you actually asked for money and came and gave you money. Do you think, and then say, met their match? We have people in C suite levels. Do you, are you matching them? We have people that are mayors. Are you matching them? We are people that have produced multi-million. Are you matching them? So the level, so 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 when you when you go and you write, have your friend write this article. You know, okay, let me say this to everybody. You know what she should have said if I was going to write this article? Tiffany Dawn Sykes has a job to hire the next AD. She she loves being at FAMU. She's looking for the next coach to be at FAMU to win a championship. She has worked with the outstanding alumni at Floyd a &M University, and she wants to make them proud. That's the article she should have wrote. That's the thing about it. You lean into the greatness of FAMU, not try to make it seem like we met their match. Because, see, then what you have just done, and let me tell you something. When I got it's, that article sent to me. You. Yeah, I'm telling you, I had at be 100 people that I'm talking about a C level and above saying, oh, really? Okay. 
And that is not what you're going to do. So when you let your friend, so, and this one is even more concerning is you basically just told your friend to write that and you gave your friend all those bullet points to say. So do you really think that is the best thing to write in this situation? So again, I, I'm always saying this, and this is to the young people. The finest point in commander language is to know when to shut up. This is an example when she didn't. Mm, mm, that's a hard article there. So, so again, to write that and to say met their match, because there is no match. You can't meet us. We're unmatchable because the alumni base is thousands of people across the world. You work for Florida A&M University. I represent Florida A&M University. Ain't the same. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it was just, it was just really, it was just really disappointing to see that, especially at Rock and, and coaches, especially when the stage is so sensitive in the coaching hire right now. Right, right, right. It is so sensitive. Why would you add that fuel to this fire? And then when you go, so basically just forget F those people. And then you, you put these things and then, and then you, and what, and what, what caught me, and then you put in big, uh, in capital letters, old. But it's the old folks. They need to get out the way. I'm 53 years old. The old See? guard. The old and, guard. And, 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 the thing, and the thing, and the thing about it, I'm going to make this one point, coach. And you're going to understand this. The smartest people are the ones that go seek the people that have the wisdom and the experience. Guess who those people are? Those are the old folks. Those are the ones that can tell you, instead of going left, you need to go right. The old folks. Those are the ones that say, I've done that job 15 years ago, and I'm going to tell you, I actually dealt with that 15 years ago. Let me tell you what you need to say. The old folks. Because I ain't never known a new fool to ever teach me anything. Right. I, be I believe in that. I believe in that. I mean, wow. That's tough, coach. That's tough there. Yeah. Now, now, when they yeah. go, now, now where we are in the in the choices, have they got it down to two or three? And why my brother's name wasn't mentioned? <laughs> what, what did your coach did your brother apply? That, that was the question. Yeah. Did he apply did he apply? Yeah, he applied. Yeah, he applied. Okay, well, I'm gonna have to go. Go. I'm have to, well, I don't. I have no idea if I can find that. Let me say that. Yeah. All, all I will say is, Coach, the, the search firm that goes back to the point. Did they have a connection? Did they even know who? If you asked that search firm, did they know who your your brother was? I will bet you a million dollars they had no clue. He he, the deepest coordinator for Clark. He was the deepest coordinator for Allen. They finished seven and three. The year before was over ten. When he got there, they finished seven and three. First winning season since nineteen. 64 and then now so, he's, at, he's at Clark plus he's won the Eddie Robinson award every coach of the year award you know four championships in a row I mean uh, they they the may have, they, they, they may have mentioned they may have mentioned your brother because there was there was a there was one candidate that was mentioned that had won coach of the year at every level and that may have been your brother yeah. um, that's true that is true that 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 is true. So I, my thing is, coach. So right now, they the AD has the list from both the selection committee and from the search firm. And I'm assuming what I would hope instead of having a friend writing articles and her wasting her time, I hope that she's interviewing people and <laughs> and doing background checks and and then maybe reaching out to stakeholders and saying, here are a couple of people. That confirm well, everybody knows the internal candidate. She don't need to do that. So this is the thing about it. She can move. I'm talking about four is saying, hey, I think this person and this person are also great with our internal candidates and start to reach out to people and to move this process along. So that's the problem. We, we don't know because, again, the communication is lacking and the, and the communication, as you can see from that article, is, is not something that I think is, is, is smart. Well, let me ask you all two something. What y'all think about my Aunt Molly's choice? <laughs> coach, I'll tell you something. I actually, and I sent Rocket, I actually watched the press conference with Coach Dishman. I did and too. I, yeah, I, I watched it. He, here's what, and I, and I think I sent it, I might have sent you a text, Coach. And I said, you know he's going to give the canned statements. And what you heard were the canned statements, right? right? I don't know. We'll tell you. We're glad to be here. We're going to be smart. We're not going to do that and all that. I think, once again, what's going to be interesting to me with Chris Dishman 
is, is he going to be able to have the ability to really understand how to coach HBC football? And what I mean by that is, like, when you go to the city of Houston, that second, that two-star kid might be a superstar, but you got to know how to coach him up. That's what we get. Are you going to understand the kid in the portal that didn't play, but is from Houston, Texas, wants to come back home? Are you going to be able to get that kid and see something in him and be able to put him on that squad? So mm -hmm. that's what the, the question is. And again, it goes back to experience. Does he have the experience in that? He, I don't think, I don't know. Does he have experience of recruiting um, portal players? I don't think so to that level. So I think once again, this is one of those ones that make me nervous about the experience side for mm -hmm. Texas Southern. So again, okay. it's good that you're going to go out there and drive around in your nice car. But again, you got to be able to identify kids that fit what Texas Southern is bringing to the table. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. well, what I, what I don't understand, Coach, I don't understand, one, the connection to TSU, and I, I don't understand even his interest in HBCU football, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, what I, that's what I don't I don't understand. One thing I have come to, come to understand is that HBCU football and HBCU culture is something different, right? Mm -hmm. And because it's... And because it's different, you have to come in with either some knowledge of it or some level of understanding. And normally that comes from either coaching in it before as an assistant coach of some sort or playing in it as a player, right? Um, and I'm I'm just saying, where do you where do you get a guy? What is the mindset of hiring a guy that his first introduction into HBCU football? is going to be as a head football coach of a team who's only won 12 games the last five years. In my opinion, coach, that's similar to what you did when you hired uh, Charles McKinney. McKinney, is that yeah. you got a guy who was yeah. outside and, HBCU football and you brought and him Mike, in as your head coach, and that was his first experience. And, and, Mike, and Mike Haywood. Michael Haywood. Remember Coach Haywood? No, nah, I don't remember him, Coach, but I trust him. Coach Haywood, well, let me give you a little quick thing on Coach Haywood. Case, Coach Haywood won the MAC at Bowling Green. He coached at the University of Texas. He coached at Notre Dame. He coached at Michigan State. He coached at LS, LSU. He, he played a role as an offensive coordinator, and he came to Texas Southern and stuck. Now, let me read this to you. Which one of y'all want this question? And I want y'all to put yourself in, in Chris Dishman's place. Coach, since 2004, Rocky, since you my right-hand man, uh -huh. TSU has won 135 games and lost 345. What difference will you bring to the program since you have less head coaching experience less coordinate experience and less swag experience than the last four head coaches that Texas Southern has hired. How do you answer that question? Coach, I'm gonna bring energy and excitement to the program with my network of coaches and former NFL players. I'm, we're gonna get in here and I know what it takes to be successful, not only as a player, but also as a coach. I coached at the division one level in Texas. I recruited here in Texas. While at Baylor, and coach, I offer something that uh, a winning attitude and uh, my work ethic is second to none, coach. Second now to that's, none. That's good. That's good, uh, coach. But tell me somewhere in your resume or in, in your career that you have took it, taken some that's at the bottom and taken it to the top. Well, to be honest with you, when I came, I grew up in the ghettos of Louisville. I was, a, I was a statistic. I'm not supposed to be here before you right now. So I started at the bottom and became an NFL football player at the highest level and would later become a, high, a become a football coach and now standing before you as TSU head coach. I'm not, by every account, I'm not supposed to be here, coach. But with my work ethic, my determination, and the grace of God, I've achieved being the head, the TSU head football coach, and I'm gonna make sure that it's something that you never, that you, that the people of Houston and TSU will never regret. All right, now 
I I want our, our, our little coach to see if that's a good answer. Is that, <laughs> is that an answer to be the head football coach? What about you, coach? Well, well see, if, if, if I'm going to be honest with you. you. You can only lean into what you are, right? You can't lean into that you're a coach because you're not a coach. You can't lean in and say that you've been on the staff, you build a championship. So if I'm Chris Disra, I'm leaning into a couple things. I've been an NFL player. I've been a winning NFL player. I've been a player that when any time I came to practice, I prepared. And my opponent knew I prepared. And my opponent, when I stood across from him, that he knew it was going to be a one-on-one -on -one battle. I'm going to instill that into these young men. Because first and foremost, before we even do any play calling, I need to make sure these men are committed to excellence. I'm going to show them how I prepared every day. Because I wasn't Coach Prime. I didn't run a 4-2. I wasn't the biggest guy. But because I came prepared every day to practice, because I studied my opponent, that allowed me to be an all-pro player. That allowed me to play big and playoff games. So that's what I'm going to lean into. You only can lean into what you are. Because, see, the problem is when we all have to start at square one, unfortunately. He's at square one. So if I'm going to start at square one, I'm going to stand on the square that got me to square one. And that is me being an NFL player, that me being a high-level player, that I can sit down to each one of these men and say, you know what? If you come to practice, you got to practice this way to get to the NFL. But that's more than that. I'm just, and I'm not telling you that. To get to them, I'm talking about the, the, the level of commitment you need to have that we're looking here at Texas Southern. And that's what I'm going to do. Now the second part of it is, and I'll say to you, Coach, well, you know what, Coach? You're right. I don't have experience. But I've got Coach Cole here. <laughs> that has 40 years of experience. I've got coach this here that has 20 years of experience. I'm going to surround myself again with some of the best coaches possible because that's the only way you can do it. That's the only way you can do it. So I'm going to lean into who I am as a player, my resume, and my ability to talk to these young men. But I'm also going to be smart and get people that are smarter than me to coach. Point so, well. So now, y'all two on the committee, is he a guy to pass on to the short list? <laughs> see, see, this, this is the oh, thing. Right. And number two, the we should have no problem with my man from Fort Valley. Oh, no, no, what? no. Okay. So I think you, uh, okay. Coach, you're talking about two totally different situations and circumstances, right? Okay. So you talk, you, so let's, 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 let's take the two programs in consideration when we evaluate who we need as a head coach. We got a championship program with a stacked roster, right? What is the number thing? What's the number one thing you don't want to happen to that team, coach? We don't want to lose that roster. <laughs> is that the is that the same consideration that TSU has? No, coach. No, we in a, we we in the eye straight, coach. We needed somebody to come in with building blocks, tool box. He got he got caterpillars, trucks. Everything in it because we, we we gotta start from the ground up. At at the at the time that Willie resigned, there were four power five players who had committed, and now I think two of them have committed to other power five programs. Uh correct. Yes. And so correct. what you were what you were talking about, you were you are in the middle of a, a team that was actually loading for bear, right? They were loading for bear coach. You want, first off, my consideration in that situation, whoever the coach is, I need it to be, I need you to get in place now because I need you to retain those players that Willie recruited, meaning that those players entered the portal somewhere. They can't sign, you know, they have to be in school by whatever school starts in, in FAMU. And so I got to get them in place so those players and current players can be prepared to be get enrolled in school the next year and not be thinking about getting in the transfer portal. That's the number one deal. I, I may have to take a chance on a coach just so I can maintain that uber talented roster. Because what <clears throat> even you say this, coach, not every guy can win with average players, but there's been a whole bunch of play coaches that can win with good players. Oh yeah, no if push. you got good players, you gonna you you can win. But there's only yeah, few. I this, I'll ahead. take a program over talent any day. I'll take a program over talent any day. So what what do you what do you consider a talented? So when you 
as a program, we know what FAMU was. As a talent, uh, on on a grading scale, what would you what in FAMU's current condition? What do you think uh, from from one to ten? Where were they as a program, in your opinion, Coach? One, one to oh, ten. Down, down. Nine, nine and a half. Okay, ten. and where were they in talent, Coach? Ten. <laughs> on, on that level. Yeah. So and, now, and I'm, you, I'm, I'm, just on the outside, I'm on the outside looking in. Because so do you need an A-plus coach? Season, yeah, the last part of the season, they weren't playing good, but they were still out-programming people. They were, they were beating them with, with talent. At the end, because I, I mean, Musa threw so many interceptions and, and so many incompletions, but they were still people were still picking up where they were hurting at. You know, either defense played well, somebody on offense made two or three big plays. Coach, they threw know. a pick six with four minutes left to, in the in the celebration bowl and didn't bat an eye. They had the lead again within two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how. That's how, that's how much better they were than everybody, you know. And I, so, I, so, I, so in that in that situation, do you need an A plus coach? Like those are the kind of situations I I think about as an AD. As an AD, you have to okay. Do I need an A plus coach to win? Right, or can I get an A plus coach? Right. Well, when you say A A plus, mm -hmm. you know it's it's a lot come around that. You know, well, what I'm it. saying is, okay, what I'm saying is... You don't want no bad coach. Let me say no, that. No, you don't want a bad coach, but but you don't need an A-plus coach. You don't need a you don't need someone who is going to jeopardize up, upsetting the roster and you having to build a I, roster I, and a coaching I staff. Rather say, I would rather say I don't want somebody to come in and thinking and not knowing what they have. I'd rather get somebody that know what they have. That's a great point, Coach. That's a great point. Out. You know what I mean? Instead of trying to, you know, like I said, do you blow up the ship or do you just keep the ship sailing and 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 and, and hard within and keep moving? I really don't think we even should be here. I'll be honest. I don't think if, if I was AD, I'd have kept things, I'd have kept things rolling. You know, and, and put my guy or which one of them I chose to lead the program and maybe put him on a two with a three year option. You know, and, 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 and kept kept the program rolling. That's what sure. that's what I would have done. And, and Rocky, I wanna kinda piggyback. If if your thing, if this goes back about being a great leader, a consensus builder, an organizer, I'm gonna use Coach Cole said, Hey, I've got the inside, the AD's worrying about APR. Well, what you do is you you put everything down. If Coach Roll or Coach Cozy was Coach, those guys would have been in school right now, ready. Those recruits, and they still would have been recruited. Then you sit down with your coach and say, Coach, here's the plan. I want to make sure we are excellent on the field and off the field. You give me a plan how you're going to do that. I'm going to help you build that plan because I come from this. I come from compliance. And I'm going to help you because you might be lacking in that, Coach. That might not be your expertise. See, this goes back to about experience. Because if you have experience in something and, and I don't have experience, then you share your experience with me and vice versa. And that's how we build a team together. Everybody's not going to have the same level of experience, right? Right. So if you have a strength versus my weakness, then we go towards your strength. So, okay, A.D. Sykes, you are a compliance person. You tell me what I need to do as a coach to make sure that we hit the 930. Well, you know what? I've been here at Dartmouth. I've been here at Grambling. I've been here. And everybody, well, this is the way we've done it. Well, you know what? I'm going to implement that. Guys, we're about to sit down, and we're about to have a compliance meeting. A.D. Sykes is going to walk us through how we're going to make sure that all of you all graduate and go to class. Boom. Now, the football side of it is, A.D. Sykes, you never hired a coach. Thank you. You've never hired a coach. So then maybe you might need to call Ashley Robinson and say, hey, wait a minute now. I'm in this situation where I kind of want to get somebody from the outside. Why did you hire T.C. Taylor? And then maybe he'll say, well, you know what? We had Ed Reed who wanted the job, but I thought continuity was best. And looking at your squad, probably for you, continuity would be best for you. That's, good. That's a good point. Good point. So good point. this is what I'm talking about when we sit back here and understand. Admit when you don't know what you're doing. Ain't nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. 
Well, what you do is you go, Walter Reed is right down in Tallahassee. Well, like I say, you go out and you talk to people because if you have these conversations, because you, there's no perfect candidate for Florida and if there is no Willie Simmons walking through the door, right? There's no perfect candidate. So you're going to have to give a little to get a little. So the question is, is the pro and con, and what I think everybody from FAMU is saying, you can't show me a coach that is that great of a coach compared to the amount of students we're going to lose football players. See, it doesn't match. You so know, you Jamie, can't. No, 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 I, I, I agree. And I was what I was going to do is bring up this right here. It said, Jamie said, this situation is so complicated between the, between the team and the AD. That's my point. It, that's what my frustration is. It's not complicated. It is absolutely not complicated. Those men went out there representing FAMU and won a celebration bowl. National championship. Those young men should have some level of influence. These guys didn't lose. They weren't one in 12. They weren't. These guys went to the highest level, achieved a swag championship and a celebration goal. I should those players pick the coach? Absolutely not. But certainly the AD should show, should listen to the players and at least as a courtesy, give Cozy, Coach Roll, Coach Smith, Coach Henry a interview before you go off and hire your ex boyfriend. Nope. Wait. Okay. Let me. All right. Let me. Okay. No, 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 no. Okay. This is so, Coach Cole. All right. I want to clear this claimer. Uh, that is not true. Oh, okay. Coach okay. Gibbs is married. He's happily married. Oh, okay. They have that. They do not. I could. I, I don't want because this is because one thing I like about this show, and again, this show is so on point because of the knowledge. And I don't want us to fall into that because what we're talking is football right now. Absolutely. So the person I want, and the only reason why I'm saying that right is all respect, but this is for Coach Cole because this is, you know, his name is on it. And I don't want anybody to say, and I know you were making a joke, of course, but I want to just put that to rest because I'm personally putting that to rest. There is no impropriety, you know, relationship between him and the AD. There's nothing like that. Coach Gibbs is happily married. And that's that. So we can move on from that. Yeah. I, so I just wanted to yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was, a, it was a bad joke, guys. My, my bad. My point hey, is he got excited, coach. He got excited. Yeah, yeah, he, 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 yeah. But but I think but the point of it, but the point, but wait a minute, let's okay, let's take what that part of the point of it is is you the person that you hired is then goes back to the pro and con list that I'm talking about. You might have liked this person. I understand. Coach Gibbs and nobody's saying he's a bad coach. But again, you have to look in the total. And we're, and Coach, you can understand this. We're living in a new age of the transfer portal. This ain't like when you could bring a, a new coach in and everybody just got to sit. They can't go anywhere. You got to acknowledge the transfer portal now. That that makes a difference. It makes a difference. I'm seeing people in Alabama freaking losing their mind because the five or six guys that's leaving Alabama, they're all upset. So again, when you have a team that is that much in unison, and let, hey, shout out to Ke um, Kevin Dean, man, the running back for FAMU that's represented FAMU so well. I mean, I'm I'm on a Kevin Dean jersey. Somebody please tell Kevin Dean to get in contact with me because that young man has represented, and he said, listen, we are together. I want to represent FAMU, and we want Coach Cody because we believe continuity will help us win a championship. I respect that. I respect that, that he spoke. Not that we're just going to hang out and kick it because Coach Cody's going to let us do whatever we want. I believe these young men understand that there's been a system put in place and the system can help them win another championship. That's what I believe. So that and that and, and and to your point, that's why I think that the article that was written by uh Bonita Bonnet is somewhat tone deaf because it's not the alumni that wanted the coach, it's the players, the young men who put on the uniform. That's who wanted the coach. And that's what's at jeopardy right now. It seems like the alumni is listening to the players more than the AD is at this point. That's my that's that's my my point is that these decisions cannot be made without consideration for the players and the young men who put on those jerseys and those helmets each and every Saturday. You can't make that decision without their consideration. Wow. Wow. I had, a, I had a text. I guess I get texts on and off. Let mm -hmm. me see. Well, Roy Wallace. He says, now, 
TSU should go in like Dion and tell them players he is going to bring his Louis Vuitton, but he can't because he doesn't know a duffel bag of players. <laughs> so they will get the same results. <laughs> Boy, folks are rough, man. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think Coach Deschman has a high mountain to climb. I really do. I, I think that, you know, back to Coach, like I said, you wanted to talk about Coach, and that's what we were talking about. I think one of the keys is going to be for him, and like I said, he said that he was going to announce the staff later because he didn't want to do it there, and I guess maybe they'll do an official thing. That's going to be r really key. And, and I, I'm going to be honest with you. I think what is going to help him, that him and Bubba do have a great relationship. Because it's nothing better than having somebody that's your boy to say, hey, man, let me tell you the real what, what you're about to get into. Let me tell you the mistakes that I made so you don't make them at Texas Southern. I believe Bubba's going to help him with that. He, Eddie George, Eddie Robinson. I think if he – this goes back to my point about if you don't know, ask. you got three of your teammates that have different scenarios that have all been there have some level of success, they can tell you the frustrations, and they can say, hey, man, don't do this on day one. Let me, do let me this say, with them. Let, let me say this. Being a head coach, you only got so many years to get it done. And if you miss year one or two, you might as well just, it's gone because you don't lost the players. Being a head coach, it ain't time to start studying for the test. Mm. Does that make sense? No, 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 OJT. Every, every program is a lot different, and I get it. But you only got eleven times to do it right, coach. Eleven times to do it right, and really, the first time that you get in there is you really establishing your program. And if you don't get it right, if you don't understand that, and then you know, here's the thing too. You got to be able to hire some good people around you, man. And here's his stat. I know he hired a, a, a guy I played with that's been out of coaching for a while. I know he kept three of the coaches that was on the staff where really one of them was administrator, and he kept actually two coaches. And then he hired an office coordinator from X, the XFL. It's nothing about it that excites me. It's nothing about the saying, man, we, we might have a chance to get this going in the right direction. It's nothing that I could see in his resume and in his experience to say, man, because wasn't he there at Baylor in their down years after they went to be, you know, well, self he, he, and, yeah, well, well, yeah. So he got hired um, the year that all the stuff, you know, kind of fell apart. Fell apart. He, he was there two years. He was there the year, which was a really good year, uh, and then he was there a year after. A year after, when they this, when when they put in uh, the the temporary coach, and then is, they, and they let everybody is go out. About coaching on Division One A level, that's all you do is coach. Now, if you got aspirations to be a head coach. Just like if you guys notice, the good coaches that, that have played in NFL, they wasn't starters. They were bench guys. They were guys coming up, learning everything else about the system. They knew the X's and O's. They started learning the why and the, and, and, and the, and the know-how and why we do this and what we do here. When you're a great player, all you're doing is focusing on playing. And, but when you're a head football coach, you can't have tunnel vision because you 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 the captain of the ship. You got to make sure the engine man running everything. And if you don't have that experience, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. What, it's tough. what I what I want, don't understand is you know why can't we get in these in these hiring meetings and talk about the qualities that it takes to be a successful head coach and what coaches have those qualities. We get so much is about whether we like the coach or not, whether the coach has some it's affiliation personal. with the school. And, 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 and I don't want to I don't want to throw fam you in that situation because I think fam you has a particular situation. When you're a championship program, when you're a championship program, you have some flexibility that other programs don't have when you're hiring a coach. I'm just gonna be straight up with you. When you're a championship program. But when you are a cellar dweller, 
a constant seller dweller, right? You have to be tuned in of about what makes programs successful and be and have someone at the helm that can implement and change the culture of those programs. That's what you need. Someone that has a proven track record of coming in and changing the culture of that program. I, I'll never forget uh, in 2007 when Baylor hired Art Bryles, who had built Houston into a winning program, right? The University of Houston. And then he comes to Baylor. There was no doubt that people believed because he had did it at Houston. And certainly if you can do it in Houston, you can do it at Baylor. And he did, right? That that track that proven track record gives a coach, gives a coach and a fan base confidence that it can be done. When Chris Dishman begins to struggle, like Art Browse did in his second year, in his second year, it wasn't a quick turnaround at Baylor, right? Art Browse struggled his second year. Are they going to have the patience of knowing that Chris Dishman has the answers to turn the program around, or is this just another guy that's in over his head? Well, let me, Coach, I want to do something for the audience because I think a lot of people don't understand your resume and pedigree. I, I'm just being honest. And you've been here. Why don't you tell the, the audience if this was the first two years, what were the, the, the things you did the first two years that you thought, that, as you look back on it, made you successful as you turned that Texas Southern program around? What were some of the things that you did those first two years? First of all, I learned something about the school, the mission statement. So academically uh, and administratively, I could be in line with them. And then I look at the program, you know, of what it needs and what it takes to have a winning program. And then I'm a young, I, I, I'm a black man that's been a black kid. And so I know things about black kids that, that first you need to, and that's, that's discipline. That's, that's clean it up from A to Z. And some play, I'm saying from cutting hair, from no baggy pants, to no uh, uh, flip flops when we travel, shirt and tie, get neck size, community involvement, taking them around, making them feel special, making make sure the alumni understand that this is our team, we need your help. Now, I ain't, I ain't talked about X's and O's because it ain't about that, you know? It's about the Jimmys and Joes. And, and when you're talking about the Jimmys and Joes, you gotta be able to go out and recruit and what to recruit. And one of the main things is being able to hire. See, I don't get into personal things with people. I want to go out and hire the best football coaches. I don't care if, if he can pass the background check, shit, he okay with me. Let's let's coach him up, everybody. Because see, I'm in charge. If he steps out of line, I'll fire him. I've fired coaches before. You know what I mean? That 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 that's a part of the business. Ain't only way we gonna make friends, and I tell the players, first meeting, I'm not here to be your friend. And you're not here to be mine. But this is how we're going to make this happen. You do what you're supposed to do. I'm going to do what we're supposed to do. And we're going to win championships. And we're going to be friends. You got, you got to know the business side of being a head football coach. How to order. What's, what's, what you got to do to order uh, equipment. You just can't get your homeboy and call him up. Man, send me a four helmets. I'm going to write you a requisition. And, and then I'm going to give you right to requisition for 10. Now I want three behind that. It's a process. And you got to learn, you got to learn the process. Scholarships on the one A level and the one double A level is different. On the one double A level, you can have them. You know, you can have a scholarship or you can fool a guy. You got to be able to play with the money. You know, kids with financial aid, and you, you got to become a businessman. At Lane College, I had seven scholarships, right? $125,000. And I think it cost about $13,000 to go to school at $13,000, $14,000. So that equal up to about seven scholarships, right? I went out and cut them scholarships up with the guy's Pell Grant, all right? And that's how I mean. Then I went out and found an apartment building that we would, that, that we would let the kids get into. 
So it's just, it's so much, you know, that you have to, to know to be successful and work on an uh, HBCU level. And you can't get in there, oh, they won't give me no money. I know one of the coaches was like, well, they gave Johnny Cole all the money, you know, and, and we just don't have enough energy in the second half. I said, well, I've never seen a team eat steak dinner at halftime so they can get some energy. That means it's something you ain't doing in practice and preparing these young men. You know, it, it's just it's just so much, man, that you got to know to, to sit in that position, and especially at HBCU. You can't go in there and complain and cry, and I don't have this and I don't have that. You got to take you got to take a nickel and make a dime, and that's just some of the stuff. And, I don't uh, want to my stuff away. But but, coach, let, let, as as we uh, prepare to wrap this up, coach, you you bring up something that that you always have pointed out to me when we first started this show, is that at an HBCU, it's just not about X's and O's, it's yeah. just not about recruiting. There's so much more to the job, and that and how important it is it for a coach to be familiar with that other stuff? It's it's well when you're the head coach, you're the one to say yes and no, and sometimes sometimes on on the HBCU campus they don't want to talk to the down guy. You got to get out of your office and walk down there. This is all the stuff that you don't. The, the, those guys don't know nothing about. And what they do, they get frustrated. When they come from, you know, having a, a locker room and, 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 and massage guys, walk down to the gym and run the track, you know, that's what we had at University of Cincinnati. You don't got that at HBCU. Your office might be, you know, <laughs> seven by six. You know, you probably got a, a desk in there. You know, you got you to gotta tell the... The reception is, hey, look here, man. Look, we can't have the kids sitting on the table. We got to be, you got to be able to answer the phone the right way. You know, we're running a program. This is a business here. We run it. If all those things ain't in place, man, you might have a donor call. Mr. Campbell going to call. Look, I want to talk with Coach Cole. I'm ready to donate 10000 She smack, oh, who is that? What, what you, you just need to call back because I'm on another line. You, it, it just, it's just something that you you got to do when you get in there and you got to do it and you got to set the president that this is how we run things here. <laughs> and that was, and that, to me, that's the difference when you start talking about a PWI and I'm not talking about Alabama. No. I'm talking about them mid-major and them other one double H teams. They run their programs like business. And that's the way we should run our program. But 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 we don't. We keep hollering about money. Man, look, you don't have it. You you gotta put it in your mind. If you if you, if your grass need cut, guess what, Rob? I'm out cutting the grass. If the grass need water, I'm gonna go to Home Depot and buy me a bunch of hoses. And so we can run. I, I remember at Lane, I'm running around, make sure the whole field get. Because I want the kids to take some pride and feel good about coming out to practice. Do you think the average man or the average person that's been living in the in, in the White House or the big house is ready to do something like that? I don't know. Y'all tell me. But I hadn't really seen it done. Since since we left Tennessee State 23 years ago, they ain't won. Since I left Lane back in seven, ain't won. Since we left Alabama State, I think they, they got to the championship. They won one with our team. They let us go in August. They really ain't won. <laughs> Texas Southern, of course, they've lost 135 games since I left. I mean, they only won 135 and lost 300 and something. Something like that. So those are things, man. It, it's tough, man. It's tough. Coach, I think that's a 40-year record. That you're talking about with the hundred yeah. and some game. That's a forty year yeah. record. Yeah, that's yeah, I'm sorry. Four hundred games. I got that wrong. Right, 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 right. You, right. you know, coach is it? You know, as you've pointed out a number of times, coaching at HBCU is is just not. It's not just football, and it's and it's so important that anybody who comes in to HBCUs to coach football 
understand that it's about so much more. Uh, so but the much. but the but the experience of that a coach gets. How, let me ask you this here, coach. How long do you think it takes a guy like Chris Dishman or even Charles McKinney to get his feet up under him and understand the culture of what it means to coach it? HBCUs and adjust to what you don't have or what you may have to get involved in. How long of an adjustment period is? Well, first, it's got to be his mindset that I'm coming here to build a program and I'm not going to sit and, 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 and ask why we don't have this and why. Ask why not. And what and what do I need to go do to find it and get it? And I got to have a staff that supports that. And sometimes when you start getting guys that's been in these big programs, they don't want to come in and support that. They want to know why, 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 why. Don't ask why. Roll your sleeves up and let's get it done. I think Coach McKinney, now that he's been through it and he has some idea of what it's about, I think he might be a little better. But you don't, you just don't have those things in place. You got to create them. You got to be able to create them, uh, uh, those things in place. You know what I'm saying? One thing we did at Tennessee State back in the 90s, late 90s, black colleges weren't even uh, going to hotels on Friday nights. So what did me and my brother do? We we had this insurance company from Whitman of the World had a campground outside of Nashville. So on Friday nights, coach, we would take our kids out to the campground. They get them off campus to be big time. We would stop at a movie, and after the movie, we go out to the campground. <laughs> the next morning, they bring breakfast out for us. We load the bus, come on back in town. Nobody had that. Nobody was doing that in the nineties, mm. except when we started that. You know, we started getting a uh, a, a, a a player development guy. We started. Uh, getting the guy who actually goes out and get our hotels for us. And they go to the hotel and have it set up. So we pulled up there at, at, at the bus, our keys and stuff is already lined, lined out. You know, so so all those things is a, is a part of it. How I want to travel. How you want to travel. What you want to do on Friday nights. What are we doing? <clears throat> and again, I ain't got to the X's and O's yet ever. No. So hey, it just, hey, it just hey coach, this this has been an amazing show, and we're about to uh wrap this thing up. But I do want everybody that's on now. We're all 225 people. First off, I want you to like the stream, and then I want you to go down to the description and follow Coach and I on social media and make sure if you're watching on off script that you click our channel our YouTube channel and go ahead and become a member and subscribe. I would certainly appreciate that as a courtesy. I certainly would appreciate that and coach Wood as well. Uh, but before we get out of here, we can't get out of here without uh, our resident Rattler give us some indication of when can we expect fam you to have their next, that would it be their 19th head football coach? Yeah, I believe so. Well, let me say this, and I and I hope I, we get to come back because the one thing I know we we talked about a lot of great things, and I, I have to break down. But we definitely got to talk about this swag schedule because I, that that we got to do that because the way that schedule is laid out, it's going to be interesting who wins the swag. So I just want to put that out there for the next time. But you know, I, I think honestly, I don't think we're going to have a coach by the end of this week. I don't believe so. I just don't. I don't believe it. And if we do. If we have a coach by the end of this week, I think it'll be somebody that people are not going to be happy about. But I'm just going to say Rattle Nation, whoever our AD at this stage, the, the AD has the choice. And what I'm hoping is that she listens to the players. I hope this coach, whoever, if this not an internal candidate, because internal candidates know what they need to do. But if this is an external candidate, I'm telling you, get down to Tallahassee. Talk to those players. Talk to the alumni so we can get behind you. Because we do, as of right now, have a championship level team. And that is going to require you to reach out and understand what you need to do to maintain that. So, you know, I, I don't think we'll have, I don't believe, because to, to what today, tomorrow's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 
Yeah, I, I, I think maybe Monday, Sunday, you, it'll probably leak that she's decided, and then Monday she'll make the announcement. That's what I believe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Coach. Uh, I mean, Mr. Campbell, I, I, I hope so, because this saga is uh, – uh, It's embarrassing. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> it, you say it's embarrassing, Coach. Why do, why do you say it's embarrassing, Coach? Because you already got a program that's fixed. It's not broken. So why blow it up? Why blow the program up? It's an it's easy choice. But when it gets personal, and when you get personal and you got tunnel vision, you mess up the process. You can still get who you want. But you got to be able to respect the process and the gatekeepers. You got you got you got to do that. You got to do that because it really makes sense, you know. Um, and hopefully, uh, uh, you know, we got these schools that's giving out tens, fifty, ten, six, seven, eight million dollars to head coaches and making decisions in four to a week's time, and here, my alma mater went for three months, two months, two and a half months, and came up with that choice. Hell, I'm going to say it. And now, fam, you, the cream of the crop, the cream of the top is better than this. Y'all better than this, Mr. Campbell. Y'all hey, better. Well, that, 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 like I say, that we brag different means something. It, it, it is a it is a real thing, and like I say, and and I'm I'm just trying to move this to a positive thing. I want our AD to understand that we want to support her, 100. percent So I think more communication, more understanding, what you know, and and talk to people that have done this. Just I had to feel like yeah, but we shouldn't be here right now because frankly, we, and this is just a fact. Forget all the rest of it. We're losing recruits. We, we had a bomb squad of kids, Power 5 kids, that clearly had Power 5 talent because they left FAMU, signed, and going to Miami, going to Virginia. I'm so that lets you know. She's, she must be totally against the two coaches on the staff. That, well, yeah, and I, I, told, and I told you why I think that she is. Yeah. You yeah. Know, and if that's the case, like you said earlier, it's legit. Just say that I don't feel that these two men – can lead our program in the, in the direction it needs to go. Well, I, I, and see, and that's what I'm saying. I would have rather for her to go on to the booster club and go to the power that's that way above my pay grade. And see, that's when you have the, the closed door meeting and say, listen, I know you want these guys, but let me tell you my vision of why I want to go outside. And then maybe they say, oh, well, you know, I didn't know that. I didn't understand that. I just know this part. I only know 50%. But this goes back to the lack of communication, and that's why you put stuff on websites instead of talking to people directly. Hey, the one thing hey, about and, the, the, and knowing, me, <laughs> knowing me, I went to the police station and got the damn uh, 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 things the cut and and it didn't dack their names out and brought them to the meeting with me and said, well, look, Boom. exactly. So, so because you got to build your case, build, build your case on why you think this because this goes back to my point anything that you do when you're making tough decisions or innovators, everybody's not going to be on board with it. So maybe she's, well, you know what? She is smarter than me. She's got a better resume than me. I'm not the AD. I never could apply for AD. So she clearly has the ability to be the AD. So I'm going to give her her respect. But my point of it is when you're dealing with other people, you got to bring them along with you. And the only way to bring them along is to explain why I'm going in the direction that you want me to go. Is, is this bringing people along with you? No, absolutely not. And, and, and that's the problem. That right there is, is called getting people against you. And I'm talking about a lot of people. Because yeah, let me tell you something, man. Listen, when, when you got cla- let me tell you the funny thing. When you got classmates of mine, I got a classmate of mine that is an attorney, and a high level attorney. And she don't even follow football, and she was like, "Oh, I'm about to write a letter to this woman directly." Well, here's here's my thing with here. Here's my thing with her. You you guys know I'm an experienced guy. I, I believe in experience. I believe you got to go through some to be 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 something. Tip. Besides APR, have she ever been in this place? Have she be, ever been in a, a part of a championship team? Basically, she's just gurgitating what she hears. That's my thing. 
where have she been on a lower level has taken the division two program to to championship of course we know she never played the game or never coached the game have she coached something else no like so she's ball. never sat in that second i'll tell you she's never sat in that second chair to prepare you for the first chair have she ever even been a coach before no 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 and and, and that's the thing she has not sat in that chair the second chair to prepare for the first chair and that is that is it is just painfully obvious when here's, we have seen what has gone what, down here's what people say to me oh well she ain't got to be this to do this she ain't got to be this to do that it's people that have not coached before it has been good but when we're talking about numbers let's talk about numbers if you put 10 people together that they ain't never sit in that seat they're not going to be victorious it's going to be more that have sat in that seat to make good decisions than ones that happen. That's that's just how it is. I'm never saying nobody has never done that. Everybody has to go through this. I, I've never said that. But with, with with you don't see winning programs going out taking chances like that. You don't see that. Well, you, you well, let you me. Don't see they go out and get winning coaches. Well, when the let me ask you guys this, because this is very interesting to me, and, and then I'll let you take us out, um, Coach Cole. When the last time a championship team, a national champion, been scheduled for as a homecoming opponent? Well, okay. Let, all right. Let, let me let me preface this though. Alabama State, I think, has their homecoming on a certain day in a certain range, and the way the schedule fell out, that's just. It was the next game up. So I don't think that was because I was, you know, again, we joked about that. And Alabama State alumni point out I me, mean, we always going to have our homecoming that weekend or somewhere around that weekend. It doesn't matter who it is. And the schedule just fell like that. So I'm not going to, you know, you know, try. Because, frankly, I, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't Alabama a and schedule Jackson State a couple of years ago for their homecoming? And got ran 69 to whatever, 63 or something? So, that's the point. That's the, that, hey, that's the point, Mr. Kemp. Yeah, like, yeah, like so. you, 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 you know, it, back when I played sports 70, 80 years ago, if you were a, a homecoming opponent, you were a homecoming opponent for a reason. Maybe that's changed nowadays, you know? Well, I, well I'm going I'm to tell you, it looks like, and again, the only other, and I, I, Alabama State people can correct me, but I was told that October 5th is usually always their homecoming or something like that. But I've been told because they because the thing about it is, yeah, something I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. And then they only got another game in October. They play Valor on the 12th. And then after that, they don't have another home game until Jackson State on November 16th. So honestly, so honestly, who were they going to play for homecoming other than Florida and Emerald Valley? And if, if their tradition is to play it on that, you know, somewhere in that second weekend or first weekend or whatever, then that's what you got. Let, let me say this, guys. Y'all appreciate this. It's up in the air, man. Ain't no, ain't no one team better than another. All the teams up in there. All the teams are homecoming teams coming in this fall. I mean, who's <laughs> gonna be dominant? You know what I'm saying? Who's gonna be dominant? Alabama State is the only one maybe have the lead of dominancy. Prairie View beat Southern. Southern beat Alcorn. Texas Southern beat Alcorn. Uh, Jackson State lose to Alcorn. But beat Southern, you, you see what I'm saying? Who's gonna be the dominant team? I, I mean, fam, you didn't lose to nobody, coach. I'm just right. reminding you. But now they don't lost their coach. We don't know who coming in there. So who's gonna be the dominant team? And let me, let me. Derek, Derek White says, "What happened to schedules made in years in advance?" That's not how the conference schedules. That's when you're scheduling out of conference teams. The out of the conference schedule is always made on a year to year basis. Other than in the SEC, when you know Alabama's going to play on the third Sunday in October versus Tennessee. So I just or you play Auburn at the end of the year. All the rest of those games are always going to be in, in the in the cake mix. So I just wanted to let them know that. Yeah, wow. yeah. I think I I think you have to because you have natural you have your division games that you have to play right, and then right. the. And then when you go across divisions, those teams rotate through one another. Is that correct? If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that's right. Yeah. And, and what's and what what and I tell you this, and this is the reason why FAMU hasn't played 
um, Alcorn because it's unbalanced on the cross match because Alcorn, because of the politics, they have a permanent cross match with Valley. And of course, they're going to have a permanent cross match with, with Jackson. So that eliminates one of their rotation games on the cross match. So they so want they to keep. Have, so, so they only have one cross match every right. six or seven years against each right. team. Right, because they already got two already booked up. Because of and it makes sense, it makes sense, but that's why everybody's like, I don't know why Jackson State is scheduling Grambling and Jackson State is playing so, and the out of conference game because those are big games, those are those are big games. So, you, 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 those are big games for the conference, and again, to sell TV time and things. So, that's why they book those games. That's why, honestly, and we talked about this on another show, that's why probably the swag needs to go to a nine conference, nine game conference schedule to, to accommodate that, to be honest with you. But that's another show for another day. Yeah. Oh, wow. Absolutely. Yeah, we got to get into this schedule because I saw some very interesting yeah. matchups. Some people um, have, you know, uh, very few home conference games. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and how does that factor in how, to how things will turn up? I, I want to say I saw a school. I saw one school, and I think it may be UAPB. They traveled to Jackson State, Grambling, Southern and maybe fam you like they they have all those games on the road like yeah the, yeah they've got Southern Jackson State Grambling and Alcorn all on the road that's what they found the road <laughs> yeah 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 and I'm like wow wow yeah but see but you got to look at what the only game that that cross match game is the Jackson State game it, that in the valley is their cross match game and I think valley is their permanent cross match so again, this is how it kind of how it kind of plays out in the West. You know, it's the same thing in the East. You got to play Jack State of FAMU. That's hey, uh, sorry, Alabama A and M. That's who you got to play. You got to play them every year. You know, Alabama State. You got to play Jack State of FAMU every year. So, it, so the good the the conference is well balanced to give us really good games through the 12, 13 weeks of the season. But you know, again, let's who my alma mater got for homecoming. <clears throat> I would assume, Coach, that your homecoming is either October 12th or the 26th, and that you play Southern on the, the, the 12th. That's probably in Dallas, right? They play that game in Dallas, right? Southern and Texas. They, play. they changed it. It's home and home now. A home and home. So Texas Southern plays October 12th versus Southern in October 26th. I bet your homecoming is probably against Grambling. Who's before and after Southern? Jackson State. At Jackson State comes to Texas Southern on the 28th. And Southern oh, again for that game. It's before the Jackson State game. Well, no, no well, well, August thirty for now. No, it can't be. No, it can't be. So last year, the last two years, y'all have scheduled y'all homecoming the same weekend as Prairie View's homecoming, and Prairie View's homecoming is the first weekend in November. Well, right. that there, there, that would be November sixteenth for them, and that's because they play Alcorn on the ninth. So well, they're going to have a. We yeah. don't play Lincoln College out of out of Oakland. <laughs> is that on there, or is that just uh, a swag schedule? Oh, you know, this is just a swag schedule. So great point. So, I, yep, that's just a swag schedule. Yep, you're you're right, Coach. I am yeah, Mr. Yeah. Probably Mr. Weekend there. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I just yeah, pulled yeah. up. I, I thought we were going to talk about it. I just pulled it up on um on swag.org, but that is not yeah, the full just, schedule. Because most of those schools don't play some type of Division One A school up top. Well, all right, Coach. Hey, man, this has been a great show, uh, everybody. Mr. Campbell, I want to thank you again for coming with us, man. And uh, I hopefully what we pe what we got you on our first contract with, we can renew you for that same. Hey, man, listen. I, hey, listen. As long as Coach will have me, I, hey, man, I already got this blocked off on the Tuesday. I usually go into the movies on Tuesday, but I'm having a little bit more fun doing this. So as long as Coach will have me, I'll be here every Tuesday. Hey, all right, man, we appreciate it. We got we to gotta put him on the, on the search more information committee. <laughs> yeah. 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 I tell you what, I would have, I, I tell you what, I would have saved family a whole lot more money and I probably would have had the coach by now. I tell you that if I would have been on that search committee. Man, my, my phone be blowing up, man. It be, be blowing up, coach. I be hitting y'all all during the day, huh, coach? Absolutely. And, and, you, and you think your phone blows up. I might, because see, like I say, I've got people from Grambling, FAMU, Jackson State, Southern, Alcorn, and people in between that I've known for 40 years that are, are in 
at these schools and say, hey, man, did you know this? I say, yeah, I just know it because somebody else just called me and told me. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and the crazy thing, there are so many things that are going on because we, we are all in a group chat together. So many things that are going on behind the scenes that we just can't talk about until they happen. You know what I mean? Like we can't, you know, and that's largely to protect our sources. And 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 we, we use the term sources. But for, Co for you and Coach, Mr. Campbell, a lot of those people are y'all close, close personal friends. And yeah. to protect those guys, we just won't, we won't breach those subjects. But they're very interesting things that are happening behind the scenes that that may or may not materialize in the upcoming weeks. And so, uh, man, it, this is a this is a weird time in the swag swag coach. Uh, and uh, this this I'm is just glad I'm a part of it. Coach. When I was coming up, this is what Eddie Robinson said on those buses when we were riding on the swag tour. He said when these non-athletic people start running the day conference. That's when our conference going to go to shit. And I ain't, I'm not saying it's going to that, but it's just a lot of things that we're not taking care of the business part of. It. You know, our business part is ragged. <clears throat> well, we got to fix it. Well, Coach, the great thing about it is you're bringing light to these things. I know a lot of people listen to this show. I, I think even more people are listening to it. So, Coach, you got to keep just preaching the gospel. And you know what? I'm just going to support you as best I can with the facts that we know as it is. That's right. That's right. And that's what it's about. And, you know, again, uh, guys in, in, in our group, if these guys sign in and subscribe to us, Rocky, you know, we, we're in the middle of talking with some sponsorship that we need more and more people to subscribe. subscribe. And then we actually can start meeting up on some of these college campuses and actually uh, presenting our coaches as well as our HBCU students, you know, on this channel. So, so hopefully, uh, you know, people start hitting that hitting that dial on there. Subscribe, yeah, I, subscribe, yeah, I'm subscribe. I, yeah, I'm really looking to, you know, we've talked about it, and and definitely Coach Campbell, Mr. Campbell, will definitely want to be a part of it. But we're looking at doing a spring football tour um, coming up, and we just, you know, we're trying to get all the dates. We got one date solidified that we know that uh, uh, we had Coach Thomas on last week and he said that his spring game is scheduled for uh april the 8th i believe he said and so as we can try to you know uh kind of line these things up and it, uh we definitely want to get out and see some of these coaches meet some of these players uh get them on our platform and all that kind of stuff and we can't do it unless we continue to grow and uh and we we have to do it with your continued support so we just asked if you could go to our youtube channel like and subscribe. We greatly appreciate it. All right, man. Man, I had a good like I love coaching. I love teaching my kids. I teach my elementary kids. Man, I just had a sportsman talk with them because, boy, let me tell you something. We played dodgeball, and I had to break up four, five fights. You know, I I, I teach at a Title I school and, and loving it, man. But, you know, and sometimes when you ain't where you are, don't worry about it. If you feel yourself at the end of the road, you tie a knot and hold on tight because ain't nobody bad like you.